Happy Sabbath and welcome to Anthem Online. Anthem Online family, we are in the midst of our holiday season right now. And I hope if you are watching us on a cool Sabbath morning, wherever you're watching us from, that you have a hot drink in hand. As you can see, there's plenty of folks here getting their hot drinks, getting ready for our service today, just like you are. I hope that this holiday season is one that you are looking forward to, that is one that is that is going to be celebrated in your home. If not, know that we are here with you, that we are here for the, you, that we would love to pray with you, that we'd love to pray over you, that we are, we are here to be a part of your community, and we thank you for choosing us to be a part of this community. Wanted to remind you, if you are local, that we are having Christmas here at Anthem. Yes, Sabbath December 25th is Christmas Day, and it is it is falling on a Saturday. So we are here to provide a worship experience for you. We are only going to be having our 10.30 a.m. service. Those of you online, this isn't going to make a difference. You're still going to see it. We're still going to have our 10.30 a.m. service live, but then we're going to have a special gathering afterwards with refreshments and drinks and just a time to be in community together. So we hope if you are local to the area, even if you're not super local, plan to come out and join us. We'd love to have you here at the Loma Linda University Church for Anthem at Christmas, December 25th, 10.30 a.m. Y'all, I am, I am ready for this service. We have exciting music planned for you. We're doing a couple Christmas songs that are phenomenal, and, and I am ready to get into it. So before we get into it, let's have a quick word of prayer. God, we thank you for this season. I thank you for this opportunity to remember who you are and what you did for us by coming in human form as an infant to this planet to walk among us. So Lord, as we remember and celebrate that this season, may we remember to follow in your footsteps with kindness, with grace, with generosity, and all that you are. And Lord, as we head into this service, may your presence be felt not only here in the space, but in every home, in every space of every person that is watching. Lord, I ask that you would pour your spirit over all those watching, that you would bless them with abundance, that they would experience your peace during this holiday season. We love you and thank you for what you're about to do here this morning. In your precious name, amen. Let's get into worship. I'd like you guys to stand and sing and worship with us this morning.
brave You free every captive You break every chain Oh God You have done great things We dance in your freedom Awaken your life Oh Jesus our Savior Your name lifted high Oh God You have done great around us with our neighbors around us so I invite you guys to say hello greet the person next to you say a happy happy Sabbath God of Abraham you're the God of covenant a faithful promises time and time time and time again you have proven you do just what you say though the storms may come and the winds may I'll remain steadfast, yes And let my heart learn when you speak your words They will come to pass us in grace
Whatever you may be going through this morning, uh, we believe that God works, uh, that he can bring peace, that he can bring comfort, that he can bring healing and restoration. Sing this. When peace like a river attended my way, when so to that hope uh, but not only that we believe in Lord haste the day today yep. the kingdom of God come now today let it be our responsibility right now to bring the kingdom of God in this place in this room uh, let our worship move from this place uh, let the kingdom of God be present here at Anthem let it move out from this place in Lord haste the day when my faith the clouds Oh, the trump shall resound Oh, the trump shall resound We say
So the late, great homiletician Fred Craddock used to say, there are two kinds of preaching that are hard to listen to, bad preaching and good preaching, for different reasons. Well, anytime a preacher hears a highly respected person in the field say something like that, you immediately begin to wonder, well, then what distinguishes the two? How does one know? Because I've concluded the only thing worse than listening to a bad sermon is preaching a bad sermon. <laughs> it's a painful experience. So how does one know? How do you know? How do I know? Well, I'm going to guess that one of the ways we evaluate such things is by asking, did it intersect with my life? Was it relevant to me? Did it have anything to do with my world? Will it make a difference in the way I live my life this coming week? Or was it just something out there that has nothing to do with life? Now, if that's a good way to ask and question whether or not it's good, then I may be in a little bit of trouble this morning. Because I'm not sure that the text for today and the lesson for today is for everybody here. In fact, I'm pretty sure there are some people it's not for. So if you are the best student in the class, if you graduated as valedictorian, if you made straight A's, this might not be for you. If you graduated from college and then immediately began to climb the corporate ladder and succeeded and everything is coming up roses and you have the Midas touch, this might not be for you. If in your athletic world, you're the champion, you could dunk at 10, you outswim all the other girls on the swim team, you hold the record in your age category at the local marathon, this might not be for you. Because it's very hard for winners, people at the top of the ladder, to relate to a young woman named Mary 2,000 years ago who was no such thing. Now, if, if you slipped into class and went to the back row in the corner and hoped no one would notice... Or if you came to church and went to one of the sides and just looked down so that no one would greet you. Or if you think, I just don't have what all these other people have. I don't know how I fit in here. If that's you, it could be for you. You might relate. You might say that passage, that text, that story connects with my life. Now, I've lived a little while, and I've lived long enough to know this, that there are people who look like they're in the first group, who if you were able to delve into their inner worlds, you would discover are in the second group. Because they project out here that all is good. Everything is great. Everything you see on their social media account is carefully edited. But if you were able to go inside here, you would discover they're not all that. They're really struggling. I say that to recognize that there may be more here than first meets the eye who can relate to our passage for today. It's been 150, 170 years ago 
Since Henry David Thoreau penned those words, the mass of men lead lives of quiet desperation. It must echo with some because that saying continues to reverberate decade after decade. People who have a painted on smile and inside are holding on for dear life. People who don't have everything that the world offers. People who don't feel like they're right up to snuff. People who think, I really don't fit in. I think today's passage is for those people, of which I am one, by the way. So we're in a series, Five Prayers of Advent. Today's our second one. Now, last week we started with a Latin name, Fiat Mihi. We're going by the Latin names for each one of these prayers because the church for centuries now has named these prayers by their Latin terms. The first word or two or three of the prayer in the Latin Vulgate of the Bible. So last week was Fiat Mihi. Let it be done to me according to your word. It was Mary's response to God's will you. And she says, yes, I will. Today we come to the second one. This, is one. this one is the Magnificat. I praise your name. My soul glorifies the Lord. It's still Mary. She's still the one praying. But it's a little bit further in the account. So it's the, the story is told in Luke 1 of what happens when the angel comes to Mary. Now Mary was a nondescript person. She was part of of a society and a world where she literally would have been background, would not have stood out. Furthermore, she had a name that would not have stood out. We know that about half, almost half of the names of women at that stage in Earth's history, half the names that we have evidences of, were either Salome or Mary. So to be named Mary was like Mary, 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 Mary. How do you stand out? You just blend in. You just become a part of the background. It reminds me of a cartoon I saw years ago of two penguins standing up on a promontory point of ice like this, and they're looking out over a sea of identical-looking penguins. They all look exactly the same. And one of these penguins looks at the other and says, you know what we need around here? Well, we need right here some name tags. <laughs> I wonder if Mary didn't feel that way, feel that she just blended into the background, that she didn't matter, that she didn't count, that she didn't have any significance or value. We noted last week that she could have been as young as 12 years old, almost certainly would not have been older than maybe her mid-teen years, and suddenly she discovers that her life and her destiny is about to radically be changed. I love the way Frederick Beekner, the writer, says it. Now, Beekner, in this piece, is writing about last week's passage when the angel came, angel Gabriel came to Mary. But I choose to read it today because it sheds light on who she would have been. So listen to what Beekner writes. He says, she struck him, that is, she struck Gabriel, the angel. She struck him as hardly old enough to have a child at all, much less this child. But he had been entrusted with a message to give her, and he gave it. He told her what the child was to be named, who he was to be, and something about the mystery that was to come upon her. You mustn't be afraid, Mary, he said. As he said it, he only hoped that she wouldn't notice that beneath his great golden wings, he himself was trembling with fear to think that the whole future of creation hung on the answer of a girl, a young girl. That's Mary. If you're looking for the valedictorians, if you're looking for the champions, if you're looking for the leaders, if you're looking for the ones who are, are at the top of the ladder, don't look for Mary. That's not who Mary is. Humble. And then she gets this news, and she responds to it with what has become known as the Magnificat. It's her way of glorifying God. 
As we read through it, you're going to notice that she knows her Old Testament scripture. In fact, one writer says, this girl knows her family because she will talk about them in elegant terms. She no doubt listened at the campfire. She no doubt heard when the scriptures were read or recited. She no doubt listened to and understood the the history of her people and the things that raise them up and the things that plunge them down because she'll refer to such things here in this prayer. About half of the prayer deals with her own gratitude with what's happening to her. The other half deals with the gratitude about what God is going to do for his people and through his people. So she's heard the message. She has said yes to God and now her future is laid out before her. And this then is what she says. Luke chapter 1, starting in verse 46. And Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arms. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but he has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months and then returned home. So when God decides that God is going to wrap himself in human flesh and is going to enter the portals of time and humanity, he does so through the womb of a young woman. This Magnificat, this prayer, is her response to that concept. That God is doing this dramatic, great thing with, with a simple, humble servant. So there's this great reversal. Because she also has things to say about the rich and the powerful and how they're going to be brought down. In fact, that's, that's very common in Luke's gospel. Luke's gospel continually shows a great reversal of fortunes, an upside-down nature of the kingdom of God when the kingdom of God finally arrives. It happens over and again. Luke is the one who draws in the marginalized, people who otherwise would not have had a place and tends to be very hard on those who think they own the place. You start thinking, you realize how much we have because of Luke. The good Samaritan out there is kind of the patron saint, if I could say it that way, of Loma Linda University. We wouldn't know about the good Samaritan except for Luke. Interestingly enough, what we have named that parable, the good Samaritan, would have been a contradiction in terms. There wasn't in the Jewish mind in that world a good Samaritan. Be like saying, the virtuous prostitute. What? The anxiety-free medical student. It just doesn't exist. Good Samaritan. We know that because of Luke. Or that prodigal who says to his dad, give me what's mine, I want out. And who goes and, and lives in the slime of the swine, finally staggering down the lane toward home. We wouldn't know his story if it weren't for Luke. Zacchaeus, the the man of small stature who so desperately wanted to see Jesus, who ran and climbed a tree and, 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 and had Jesus look up into the tree at him and say, Zacchaeus, guess who's coming to dinner? We wouldn't know his story if it wasn't for Luke. Luke does this great reversal, turns things on their head. In fact, think about the difference between Matthew and Luke in terms of how they record that sermon that Matthew calls, essentially, the Sermon on the Mount, and in Luke we could call the Sermon on the Plain. In fact, in Matthew, Matthew says Jesus went up on a mountain and sat down and taught his disciples. Luke says Jesus came down from a mountain to a plain, stood up, and taught the multitudes. 
Well, did he go up and sit down or he go down and sit, stand up? I mean, what did he do? Some say, well, he preached it twice. Okay. But there are some differences in the context and the statement of what he says. Matthew says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. It's spiritual. Luke says, much more raw, much more earthy, blessed are the poor. Blessed are those who hunger. And then he turns around and he says, but woe to you who are rich. Woe to you who are full now. Because a different day is coming. Luke does that. He, he turns things upside down. Jesus brings a kingdom that results in a great reversal. And Mary, this young woman, knows that. Listen to what Eugene Peterson says about this prayer, this Magnificat, and the reversals. Peterson writes, the heart of Mary's prayer, as it was for Hannah's, Hannah's was the mother in the Old Testament, mother of Samuel, who had a very similar experience to Mary, and from whom Mary draws in what she says, the heart of Mary's prayer, as it was for Hannah's, involves three great reversals in the way we experience the world when God conceives new life in us. God establishes his strength and disestablishes the proud. That's the first reversal. God puts down people at the top and lifts up people at the bottom. That's the second reversal in her prayer. God fills the hungry and sends the rich away empty. That's the third reversal. The proud, the powerful, and the rich are reduced to size. God, the downtrodden, and the deprived are perceived truly, filled out in dimensions of majesty, wholeness, and dignity. Revolution, but in God's way, not ours, is on the horizon. This is Mary. This humble young woman, maybe as young as 12 or 13 years of age, so deeply embedded in her family's history, so filled with the Spirit, that when she begins to pray, she talks about what God is doing. In a sense, what Mary is saying, if you would permit me to paraphrase, she's saying, I can't believe I'm in on this. Me. On this great dramatic thing that God is about to do in the world. Because she's not a leader. She's not a winner. She's not first place. She's just Mary from down the street. Remarkable. In fact, I've come to believe that this prayer, the Magnificat, could, could be summarized in one word. You remember last week, the fiat me, he also Mary, God saying, will you, will you? We could summarize her answer, her prayer in one word, and that was yes. I think this week's prayer could be summarized in one word. And that one word is a question. Me? Me? You, you talking to me? <laughs> Seriously? I don't think you have the right person. Kind of remind, right, reminded me this past week, actually, of Groucho Marx decades ago. American comedian, writer, film and television star. It is said, I looked it up on the internet and tried to do all kinds of research, it appears that it was legitimately him, though some say it may have been someone else. There's reason to think it was him. They even have a date for the letter. That Groucho Marx wrote a letter of resignation to the Friars Club. Didn't want to be a member anymore. And the reason he gave was very simple. He said, you know, essentially, take my name off your rolls, your records, whatever. I don't want to be a member of your club, he said, because I would never be a member of a club that would have me as a member. <laughs> Go figure. I would never be a member of a club that would have me as a member. I will not stoop that low. <laughs> in a sense, that's kind of Mary in a different way, saying, me? Are you serious, me? The English playwright Dorothy Sayers says that God had three great humiliations. Three great humiliations. Says God's first great humiliation was the incarnation, the manger, 
Bethlehem, what we're celebrating at this time of year, when God wrapped himself in human flesh and became a weeping, wailing babe in Bethlehem. That, says Sayers, is God's first great humiliation. His second great humiliation, says Sayers, was the cross. When Jesus allowed himself to be nailed to a rough-hewn cross and to hang suspended between earth and sky, Earth didn't want him. Heaven couldn't claim him yet. Humiliation. Third great humiliation, says Sayers, the church. Me. You. She says that's God's great humiliation because God has left himself without witness in the world except essentially the church. So that if people want to say, what is God like? Well, there you go. Oh, seriously? She said, that that's humiliating. Us? Can you really mean that? Me? Well, Sayer says that's God's third great humiliation. But that's what God is essentially doing with Mary. He's saying, Mary, I have a mission for you, a purpose. And Mary says, me? She says, yes. See, because God is looking for far more than what we normally look for. The truth is, what we seek when we want to do something important is we look for the gifted people, the talented people, the educated people, the moneyed people, the people who can get the job done. Anywhere in our lives, you want to play intramurals? What do you do? You immediately start looking for the athletes. You want to accomplish something in terms of music? You immediately start looking for the talented, gifted musicians. Wherever you go, those are the people you're seeking. But in Scripture, over and over again, God does it backwards. God does it upside down. Because God is looking for people of humility. People who are willing, when asked, are willing to say, me? Oh, no, 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 no. I, I, I think you have the wrong person. And God says, the fact that you say that confirms that I don't. Mary. So I got to thinking about this and I realized, you know, a lot of times at, at Christmas time, I don't know how it is in your house or how it was in your house, um, mom and dad will get the kids together and sit down by, at the kitchen table or by the fire or wherever and, and, and read some stories. So I thought, let me read you. It's, in a sense, a story, in a sense, today. It's written by Rebecca Samke. She was the former admissions director at Dartmouth. She wasn't working there at the time that she wrote this. She had pulled back from that because she had had a child. But Rebecca Savke had spent a great deal of her life looking for the best, the brightest, the most gifted, the most promising, looking everywhere she could to admit those students to Dartmouth so that Dartmouth could shine and so that they could get their education and so that they could shine. That was her life and world. That's what she spent her time doing. But then she wrote an op-ed piece for the New York Times back April 4 of 2017. It was entitled, Check This Box If You're a Good Person. And in this op-ed piece, she throws some light on something that relates to Mary. So I want to read it to you. It's just an op-ed piece, Re Rebecca Sapke, April 4, 2017, Hanover, New Hampshire. When I give college information sessions at high schools, I'm used to being swarmed by students. Usually, as soon as my lecture ends, they run up and hand me their resumes, fighting for my attention so they can tell me about their internships or their summer science programs. But last spring, after I spoke at a New Jersey public school, I ran into an entirely different kind of student. When the bell rang, I stuffed my leftover pamphlets into a bag and began to navigate the human tsunami 
that is a high school hallway at lunchtime. You've been there, haven't you? Just before reaching the parking lot, someone tapped me on the shoulder. Excuse me, ma'am, a student said, smiling through a set of braces. You dropped a granola bar on the floor in the cafeteria. I chased you down since I thought you'd want your snack. Before I could even thank him, he handed me the bar and dissolved into a sea of teenagers. Working in undergraduate admissions at Dartmouth College has introduced me to many talented young people. I used to be the director of international admissions and am now working part-time after having a baby. Every year, I'd read over 2,000 college applications from students all over the world. The applicants are always intellectually curious and talented. They climb mountains, head extracurricular clubs, and develop new technologies. They're the next generation's leaders the accomplishments stack up very quickly. This mic is having problems. First service today, I dedicated triplets. Triplets, first time I've ever done that. And one of them would not let go of my mic. By the time it was done, it was... So, anyway. If I keep reaching, you'll know why. The problem is that in a deluge of promising candidates, many remarkable students become indistinguishable from one another, at least on paper. It is incredibly difficult to choose whom to admit. Yet in the chaos of SAT scores, extracurriculars, and recommendations, one, one quality is always irresistible in a candidate. Remember, this is Director of Admissions for Dartmouth College. One quality is always irresistible in a candidate. Kindness. It's a trait that would be hard to pinpoint on applications even if colleges ask the right questions. Every so often, though, it can't help shining through. The most surprising indication of kindness I've ever come across in my admissions career came from a student who went to a large public school in New England. He was clearly bright, as evidenced by his class rank and teacher's praise. He had a supportive recommendation from his college counselor and an impressive list of extracurriculars. Even with these qualifications, he might not have stood out. But one letter of recommendation caught my eye. It was a letter of recommendation from the school custodian. Letters of recommendation this is an admissions counselor saying this. Think about this. After all those letters of recommendation you've got, <laughs> letters of recommendation are typically, she says, superfluous, written by people who the applicant thinks will impress the school. We regularly receive letters from former presidents, celebrities, trustee relatives, and Olympic athletes. But they generally, generally fail to provide us with another angle on who the student is or who the student could be as a member of our community. This letter was different. The custodian wrote that he was compelled to support this student's candidacy because of his thoughtfulness. This young man was the only person in the school who knew the names of every member of the janitorial staff. He turned off the lights in empty rooms, consistently thanked the hallway monitor each morning and tidied up after his peers, even if nobody was watching. This student, the custodian wrote, had a refreshing respect for every person at the school, regardless of position, popularity, or clout. Over 15 years and 30,000 admission applications during my admissions career I had never seen a recommendation letter from a school custodian. It gave us a window into a student's life in the moments when nothing counted. That student was admitted by unanimous vote of the admissions committee. There are so many talented applicants and precious few spots. We know how painful this must be for students as someone who was rejected by the school where I ended up as the director of admissions. I know firsthand how devastating the words, we regret to inform you, can be. Until admissions committees figure out a way to effectively recognize the genuine but intangible personal qualities of applicants, we must rely on little things to make the difference. I want you to listen to what these little things are in the mind of this Dartmouth 
admissions director. Sometimes an inappropriate email address is more telling than a personal essay. Just a reminder, this is in the New York Times. This is not a church paper. Sometimes an inappropriate email address is more telling than a personal essay. The way a student acts toward his parents on a campus tour can mean as much as a standardized test score. And as I learned from that custodian, a sincere character evaluation from someone unexpected will mean more to us than any boilerplate recommendation from a former president or a famous golfer. <laughs> Next year there might be a flood of custodian recommendations <laughs> after this essay. But if it means students will start paying as much attention to the people who clean their classrooms as they do to their principals and teachers, I'm good with that. I'm happy to start that trend. Colleges should foster the growth of individuals who show promise not just in leadership and academics, but also in generosity of spirit. Since becoming a mom, I've also been looking at applications differently. I can't help noticing my son's own dive. I can't help anticipating my son's own dive into the college admissions frenzy 17 years from now. But whether or not he even decides to go to college when the time is right, I want him to resemble a person thoughtful enough to return a granola bar and gracious enough to respect every person in his community. That's some good stuff. You know, it's not that far off of what God does with Mary. I mean... What interest her was kindness, generosity of spirit. And make no mistake about it, Jesus in Luke's gospel would certainly be in favor of kindness and generosity of spirit. But the truth is that Jesus in Luke's gospel is concerned with something even more than that. He's concerned that people at the top of the ladder realize that being at the top of the ladder offers them nothing in kingdom terms. Nothing. Doesn't get them one step ahead of anyone else. And he wants people to understand that just because they're at the bottom of the ladder doesn't keep them out of anything in the kingdom. They are just as welcome in the kingdom as anyone else. And the amazing thing to me is that a young girl understood that. Just this young girl, 12, 14, 16. She understood it not just mentally, cognitively. She understood it so much that when she prayed her prayer of magnifying God, you see written between the lines her attitude that's saying, Me? You sure you got the right person? Me? That's the Magnificat. If you don't know what to say to God when God taps you on the shoulder and says, I have something for you, not only to be my child, not only to walk with me, but I have something in your life that I want to do in the world, in your world, in the greater world, something that will forward the kingdom of God. If you have no idea what to say, just take a look at yourself in the mirror as I have myself and the word will fall from your lips. Me? God, are you sure you got the right person? You know, you could summarize the Magnificat in one word and that word is me, a question. But it's not the whole thing because if you really want to pray the Magnificat. I think this is what you have to say. You have to ask, me? And then you have to say, well, God, if that's right, if it is me, then the only thing I can say is my soul magnifies the Lord. 
What a message from Pastor Randy. I was so touched by that story he shared of the admissions officer and about how important kindness is. I hope you were also as blessed by his message today. I feel like the Lord spoke through him in incredible ways. I want to remind you again that we are so appreciative of your commitment, of your weekly commitment in joining us here at Anthem Online. We would love to see you in person. Know that you can always join us right here on the campus of Loma Linda University here at the Loma Linda University Church. Service is 1030 a.m. noon. We'd love for you to follow us also and be a part of our Instagram community, Anthem XLLUC. And finally, as you know, it is because of your continued consistent giving that we are able to do what we do. So as a reminder, there's a phone number on screen you can text. There's also a website, lluc.org slash give that you can give. Thank you for your continued commitment to this ministry. We have some incredible things planned for 2022. I can't really share them, but I'm going to be, I'm promising you we have incredible things planned and we want you to be a part of it. So please make sure you are following and a part of our Anthem community here. We hope you have a wonderful week ahead. Be blessed, be a blessing, and we'll see you next week.